surprising. First time we saw the angel of God appeared. In chapter 14, he was in front of the camp and moved in the back and he brought light. He brought light over the Israelites. Later on, Jesus will say, I am the light of the world. We saw later on how he appeared again. It was a long time after this. And we saw how he appeared in chapter 30, uh, 23 when God said to Moses, Behold, my angel goes in front of you. My angel. And he will lead you and keep you. He didn't say forgiving. No. But because we want to continue, I want to go back for a moment to chapter 23. Because he said, when the first time the angel appeared, he said to Moses very important thing. Not only that my name is in him, not only that he told him to obey him. Yeah, I think I don't see my glasses. Maybe there are some words there, if somebody will find. Ah, I see here. <laughs> now, pray, pray the Lord, I can share this subject with blind eyes. Believe me, it is so important that every word, every verse, I remember it. I pray I remember it also in 20 years when I will be 92 because it is so important, so important. So let us go quickly a little bit more to chapter 23 before we go on. What else he said about this angel? Look what he says. If in verse 22. I go back. Exodus 23, verse 22. He says, if you will hear his voice and you will do everything that I told you, then look how I'm going to reward you. I will be an enemy to your enemies, an adversary to your adversaries. You see, for my angel will go before you and bring you into the Amorites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Canaanites, all these names that you don't like to read them. You shall not bow down to their gods, nor serve them, nor do according to their works, but you shall utterly overthrow them and completely break down their a sacred pillars. You see what he says to him? He says later on, verse 25, if you will obey him and not do what they do, look what, I'm going to bless your bread, your water, I'm going to take any sickness from you. Look at verse 26. No one shall suffer miscarriage or be barren in your land. I will fulfill the number of your days. And he continues and continues and what he wanted? Only one word. Obey my angel. Obey him. This is the key word on our life to obey and look what promises were waiting for our nation if they were obeying me and my family we decided to obey him whatever he asked we obey me leave music leave music Leave your home, leave your home. Go move and be a carpenter, be a carpenter. Tomorrow he will tell me to be a street cleaner. I will do it joyfully. Because it's not important what I do. What is important that I obey him. You see the point, obey. And look 
Look what he is telling us, what he will do if we will obey him. So we go back to chapter 32. You remember how, where we were? Remember? That Moses was very angry. If you forgive them, okay. <laughs> okay, but if not, be careful of it. And God told him, no, 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 go, 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 go. Angel, my angel is in front of you. And now we come to chapter 33. It's so mysterious. There are so, so secrets in this chapter. You can't believe. And for those who read it for the first time, wow, you are going really to see amazing things. And how it starts. God says again to Moses, climb from here and you and the people that you took from Egypt and go to the promised land which I promised you, right? And then verse 2, and I will send in front of you what? What I will send? Angel. Did you know that already we are in the fifth angel? Fifth time that angel is mentioned? You ever noticed that the angel appearing so, so many times? Anyone knew it? I'm really surprised to know. Look. And but now this is going to be very, very. My angel go before you. And I will drive out the Canaanite, an Amorite, and a Hittite and the Perizzites, and the Hivite, and the Jebusite. So go up to the land flowing with milk and honey, for I will not go up in your midst. Oh, 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 stop, stop, stop. What you say, God? I say that I will not go up in your midst. Why, Lord? Because if I will go, I will consume you on the way, for you are hearts. <laughs> Stuff naked people. This is the first time that God tells us He's not going to walk in our midst. God is not going. Who will go? The angel of God. Very good. You start getting into the routine. I will not go in front of you. You understand why when we say who took Israel out of Egypt? Rabbis will tell you angel of God. And you mistakenly will say God. No, God says, I will not go. If I will have to go, I will consume you because I'm a consuming fire. And not only this, the people have heard this word and they started weeping and crying and God continued again in verse 5. Go to them, tell them you are stuff naked people. A moment I am among you, I will consume you. So, that's why I am not going to do it. And look what happens now. He told them, take off your ornaments that I may know what to do to you. So the children of Israel stripped themselves of their ornaments by Mount Horeb. You turn to the next verses. And Moses took his tent for the first time and he pitched it outside the camp, far from the camp. All the, all the camp was all over the stage. Look over the stage. Moses took his tent far far, far away, far away, and, yeah, thank you, and from that moment, this is another function, this is called the tent of meeting, God from now on is going to meet Moses where, far away, very important, not in the middle of the camp, because God said, I will consume them. I cannot be in the midst of you. So I will go there. I meet you 
in the tent of meeting. And now it describes how it, wh what happened. It came to pass that everyone who saw the Lord went out. He came like a cloud, like a typhoon. And he came down, 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 down to the tent of meeting. And when all the people saw it, everyone stood out of his tent. And what they did? They bowed down. You see, the moment they saw the pillar coming down, the tabernacle, they bowed down. And the people was witnessing to what is going to be now. And here we're coming to maybe the highest point. We come that verse 11, that God was talking to Moses face to face as a man speaks to his friend. Remember this, Exodus 33, verse 11, only place in the Bible. God was talking to Moses face to face, as a friend speaks to his friend. Now, if we would not continue on, and I will stop here, and I will talk half an hour, about God is our friend, and that's why Jesus is our friend, and that's why, what a friend we have in Jesus, right? I like improvised jazz. Ba -da -bum -bum, ba -da -bum -bum. What a friend we have in Jesus. Here, look, God is friend of Moses, talking face to face. Shut up, Arye. Because this is not what God says. You understand? Go on and read how danger is to take a verse two verses and build full theology on them without even looking forward a little bit forward not many chapters the same chapter five verses for for but before we do it let us see verse 12 and remember Joshua Yehoshua is young, young man, and he's near Moses. He was witnessing to all what happened. And now we start a discussion from verse 12. And this discussion is very interesting. <laughs> In this discussion, Moses talking, God answer. Moses talking, God answer. Moses talking, God answer, God answer, God answer, God answers. Why is it important for me to say Moses, God, Moses, God, Moses, God, God, God? Because at the beginning it's written and Moses said, and God said, but by the time, and he said, and he said, and he said, you, don't, you forget who's saying what. You see? So very important to see who is saying. It's, we start with Moses. Yes, he said to the Lord, see, you say to me, bring up these people. But you have not let me know who will you send with me. I've heard you again and again say that my angel, my angel, my angel, my angel. But who is this? What is this? What is the meaning of this? <laughs> you didn't tell me whom you sent with me. But you said that you know me by name and I've also found grace in my sight. So please give me more data, more info about this angel that you are going to send. Wow. Let us hear what God is going to tell him now. What God is saying to him. Very strange. Right? Verse 14. And God says, My face, sorry, not my presence, not my presence. Correct it in your Bibles. I know in digital you cannot do it anymore. Finished. But if you have paper Bibles, right behind presence 
or of the sight. In Hebrew, there is no my presence. There is no my countenance. They are not this world. There is only one word. And what is the word? My face. My face, my face, my face. So important to go to the original. What it tells him? My face will go with you and I will give you rest. What? Face can go? Face can walk? Face has legs? What is the meaning? My face will go in front of you and give you rest. Maybe we don't understand it, but Moses understood perfectly. How we know it? Look the answer of Moses. What he said, the next verse. Moses said it, verse 15. That's how he told you, Moses, God, Moses, God, Moses, God, God, God. So now it's turn of Moses say to him, if your face doesn't go with us, do not bring us up from here. I like this. He understood who is this face. And if the face is not going to lead us, to be with us, I am not going to move one step from here. Sorry to be a little bit more extreme. You told me before in the same chapter that you are not going in the midst of us, that you will consume us, right? Now I say, my turn to say, that if your face is going with us, I'm also not moving from here. Very interesting. Why? Because suddenly the face is going to be the same function as the angel. Because God said, my angel, my angel, my angel. And now how he calls him? My face. You understand how important it is? And then he continued, oh, because so we shall be separate, right? Your people and I from all the people who are upon the face of the earth. And he continues, Moses continues, and is going all the way. And asking in verse 18, show me your glory. And God is answering him, verse 19. I will pass all my greatness in front of you. But, verse 20, you will not be able to see my face. Because no man can see my face and stay alive. You understand why before in verse 11, I didn't start dancing and talking, wow, what a friend. Oh, because now God is saying, no, you cannot see my face. In other words, what you saw before is not my face, it's not me, it's not me, but what you saw, my face, and my face shall lead you, and my face will now take you. And when the rabbis had met these verses, it was so complicated for them to understand. Till they understood something, which is true, biblically. There was one angel, and this angel was called the angel of the face of God. We'll find in a moment where he is mentioned. And this angel is very peculiar, very special angel. When people tell me, show us Messiah in the Bible, let us, we are studying, we are studying. This angel, the only angel that could stand in front of the face of God. And that's why it was called the angel of the face of God. All the angels, according to Isaiah chapter 6, they had to cover their legs. They have to cover 
their faith. And with the last two to fly. That's why how many wings they had? Six wings. Two covering their legs. Two flying, two covering their head, their face. But there was one that has a full mandate to stand straight in front of holy, holy, holy God. And what is his name? The face of God. And as you will see, the Bible calls him the angel of the face of God. And what is character? Do you remember? He, the, God, the name of God is in him. Chapter 23, verse 20. My name is in him. So he appears fully God. Who is this angel? You know who reveals us who is this one? Prophet Isaiah. Let us go to Isaiah chapter 63. Isaiah chapter 63. And let me give you a quick background. Isaiah 63, the famous chapter that describes Messiah coming again, but it's not like the Lamb of God that carries the sins, but like what? Lion of Judah. Sorry, it's my name. Lion of Judah. And where he's coming from, Edom. And all his garments are red, like a man that was threatening his enemies. And now all his garments with blood. And Isaiah 63, look on this. Who is coming from Edom? Who is coming from Batra? And people look on him. Why your garments are like dyed with red as a man that just came from the wine press. And he answers them. Isaiah 63. I have trodden the wine press alone. And from the peoples, no one was me. For I have trodden them in my anger and trampled them in my fury. Their blood is sprinkled upon my garments and I have stained all my robes. This is what the Bible called the day of vengeance. This is what two chapters before Isaiah 61, when Jesus read in the synagogue, he said, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he anointed me to talk to the poor in spirit, to the humble, right, and so on. To heal. He sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captive, to open the people from the prisons to those who are bound. All this is in one verse. And look, when he came to the next verse, to call, to proclaim the accepted year of the Lord, he stopped. He didn't read on. What is the next? You know this. He didn't say to proclaim the day of vengeance of our God. No, he didn't say it when he was in the synagogue. And the people got angry. Because they thought Messiah will deliver us from the Romans. He will release us from the bondage of the Romans. He will call it day of vengeance. No, Jesus was not then, 2,000 years ago, to release them. But look to chapter later again, 63. He describes how he's coming from Botsra. And he says, I was trolling my enemies, you see, like in a wine press. And then, chapter, again, 63, very good. For the day of vengeance is in my heart, and the year of my redemption. 
redeemed has come. We have to separate very clear this coming of Yeshua as the Lamb of God and the coming of Yeshua as the Lion of Judah. All, you all agree with me? All of you? There are two different events. The same way. We have to separate between coming of Jesus 2,000 years as the Lamb of God and coming of Yeshua as the angel of the faith of God to the children of Israel and leading them all the way to the promised land. The same way. And that's why he could not, he had no mandate to forgive them then. Very important to to understand who is Yeshua. And now look, this is only verse 4. The next verse, and the next verse, you can put three of them. For I looked, but there was no one to help. I wondered, there was no one to uphold. Therefore my own army brought salvation for me, and my own fury is sustained me. What is the meaning of this? When you will be in Yadish Monai, our village, I will make with all of you biblical garden. I do it with all groups, biblical garden. And we will be in the wine press. And I will so show you that once you are coming to the moment that you are starting to throw the, right, the wine, you hold a rope with your right hand and you cry in Hebrew, hey, dad, hey, dad, and you step, step, step on the grapes. You break them. And the moment you cry, hey, dad, hey, dad, people from far, can we join? Of course you can join. And in a few minutes, all is full of people holding the ropes. And, you know, hey, dad, hey, dad. And sometimes by mistakenly, boom, they slip down. They <laughs> drink quickly from the wine and continue. Oh, oh. So you never throw the wine in the wine press alone. Always, immediately people join. You clear? Clear? And what he said here? I wondered that there was no one with me. I did it alone. Remember the word alone. The cross. Action of the cross he did alone. Action of coming like Lion of Judah he will do alone. What he said, my right hand delivered me. All our salvation is thanks to him alone. If we think that we help him, we don't know what we talk. Okay? He gives us to collect some crumbs. Not more than this. He is doing it alone. And then, therefore, my own arm has saved me. That's why I've trodden them. I my, by my fury. But now we come to verse 7. 7, verse 7 is another music. Is another opera, like we say. Total different. If the first six versions were blood and blood and the clothes is full, look what happens now. I've trodden. Uh, yeah, I will mention the loving kindness of the Lord and the praises of the Lord according to all that the Lord has bestowed on us and the great rudeness toward the house of Israel which he has bestowed on them according to his mercies, according to the multitude of his loving kindness. What is the meaning? I mean, how it can be on the same chapter that such a verse appears? It should be totally, totally different picture, right? Till now we saw the blood and we saw it. And suddenly, what happens here? Let us see the next verse. Verse 8. For he said, in a moment we will see who is he. Surely they are my people, children, who will not lie. So he became their, their savior. In a moment we will see what is happening here. Go on, next verse. 
in all their affliction, he was afflicted. And the angel of his face, in Hebrew, saved them. How in his love and in his pity he redeemed them. He bore them and carried them in the days of old. Isaiah is somewhere, he see a vision. And in the vision he see the angel of God, verse 1 full of blood coming from Botra, from Edom, and trotting in this. And he looks at him, Lion of Judah, he looks at him, he looks very careful. And suddenly, in verse 7, he remembers, I've seen him somewhere. I've seen the same angel. And recognize, this is the angel of the face of God. This is the angel that was carrying them. You see what he says? I mentioned the loving of uh, uh, God. This angel, he has bestowed on them according to his mercies. This angel, the next verse, he was carrying them like a shepherd on his hands. This angel became their savior. Are you with me? This angel, he was on the side of Israel. God said, I will consume you. Moses said, sorry, I was not pregnant with this nation. He, this angel of the face of God, he delivered them. He became their savior. But look, even after this, the next verse, 9. In all their affliction, he, Yeshua, the angel of the face of God, he was afflicted. You see the point here? It was very hard for him to see what happened with Moses that was not permitted to enter to the land. It afflicted him. He suffered from this, but he had no mandate. To forgive him. Remember, not yet. But look, he saved them. How? In his love, in his pity. He redeemed them and bore them and carried them all the days old. Beautiful. Go to the next verse. Beautiful pictures of Yeshua, son of living God that left his father presence and came to this world to do what? To save us from Egypt. To save us from bondage, physical bondage. Remember this. It started in the Passover and it continued all the way till they arrived to the promised land. He was the one. And that's why his name is the Savior. You saw he saved them. Because he did it first time to save us physically bondage. He will come again in this time to, this, to deliver us from the spiritual bondage. How? Forgiving our sins. More clear. More clear than this picture of Yeshua cannot be. The angel of the face of God. Look how strong he says, in all their affliction, he was afflicted. In all their afflictions. And that's why he could carry us. This is the face of God. The face of mercy, of grace, of love kindness of compassion, Yeshua. Let us go, because all the next verses, till the end of chapter 63, are again and again more pointing. 
Look, they rebelled and grieved his Holy Spirit. That's what Moses did. That's what Aaron did when God told him, talk. And they beat at him. Remind you, chapter 23, don't rebel against him. What is written here? They rebelled. They rebelled against him. So what happens when they rebelled and grieved his? So he, Yeshua, turned himself against them as an enemy. As an enemy. There's so much about this word, as. Joseph became as an enemy to his brothers. Why? Because they rebelled. They had to study a lesson. Your spies! You came to spy the land! He became as an enemy. But every time, four times, he was running to another room and he was crying and crying and crying and crying because it was not his character. His character, his love was so strong to his brothers that it was hard for him to act as an enemy. So he turned to be as an enemy against them. As he's fighting against them. No, he finished his mission. And later on, read this chapter. Wonderful chapter. He described how Yeshua was on the right side of Moses. How he was leading them down and up when they crossed the water. How he was leading them. And again, like a shepherd that carries the sheep. Then he remembered the days of old. Isaiah is living 700 years before Jesus. And what he reminds us, the day of old, that happened 500 years before this. He remembered the days of old. Where is he who brought them up out of the sea? with the shepherd of his flock. Where is he who put his Holy Spirit within them? Where is Yeshua? Where is he? Where is the angel of his face? And that's why Isaiah will continue later on, other chapters. Lord God, shine your face upon us. Let you open the earth and appear again, like in the days of old, like in the days that you shine us with your face, with Yeshua. Yeshua is the angel of the face of God. No other one can replace Yeshua in this function. No other angel got the name of God so strong in him that he had permission to forgive or not to forgive. Only the Son of God had permission. And this is Yeshua in the Old Testament. Yeshua in the Torah. And let us go now on. Remember his mandate, because time started running, his mandate is to carry the people, to keep them and bring them to the land. And what happened when he brought them to the land? Let us turn to Deuteronomy chapter 31. And let us read from verse 16. Yeah, I omit now the Isaiah, very important, very important. But I want to go a little more with the angel of God. We go Deuteronomy. Chapter 31. The Deuteronomy, book of Deuteronomy, the fifth book of Moses, deserves a special seminar only on it. There are treasures. Treasures. They're pointing about Yeshua. Remember, the autonomy, Yeshua was citing the autonomy more than any other books of the Torah. In chapter 31, so a little bit of background, right? 
God appeared to Moses. Moses was 120 years old. And God told him, you should not cross over the Jordan. And I will give you a quick background. Meanwhile, you turn to verse 16. 16. And God told him, go take Joshua, anoint him. Yehoshua, Yeshua, the same name, anoint him. The Savior, he will take them to the promised land. Remember what you did? There, with your, with your rod, you are not allowed to carry them. Joshua will do it. And then God told him in verse 16, Behold, you are going to die. You are going to rest with your fathers. In other words, to die. And these people will rise and play the harlot with me. How? They will play the harlot with all the gods that are in the, in the country that you are going to enter with all the foreigners of the land. They're going to go there and forsake me and break my covenant which I have made with them. We go on to the next verse. Look, there is not word if. God is not telling Moses if the moment you will die, they will break the covenant by harloting with all the gods of the foreigners. What he says, they are going to do it. Very important, they are going to do it. And because they are going to do it, my anger shall be aroused against them in that day. And it will forsake, I will forsake them. How? This is the key word. What I will do? I will Hide my face from them. This verse, Deuteronomy chapter 31, first time it appears in the Bible. First time. God telling the people without if, I am going to forsake you and to hide my face. What it means literally? To hide Yeshua from you. Very critical moment. Remember what was the man that? To keep you and to lead you. Two. Two. Now, Moses is standing on the Transjordan mountains, is finishing his long speech, which was more than 31 chapters, and he's going to die. The angel finished his mandate, and what God says will happen now, I hide him from you. And look, what is the meaning of these words? I'm going to, I forsake you, I hide. I will hide my face from them, and they shall be devoured, and many evils and troubles shall befall them. So they will say in that day, have not these evils come upon us, because our God is known among us. And in order to make it more strong, we go to the next verse. I will surely hide my face in that day. In Hebrew, it's much stronger. I will hid, hide my face. In Hebrew, hastir, hastir, panai mehem. Wow, it's terrible. And not surely. I hid, hide. He's repeating the same word with different sound, which has no meaning. Hid, what is hid? Hid, hide. Just to show how seriously from them, because of all the evil that they are going to do. And now, therefore, write down this song for yourself and teach it 
to the children of Israel. Teach it so well that they will have it in their mouth. In other words, they will know it by heart. And this song, by the way, the next chapter, Deuteronomy 32, it has to be so strong in their mouth, so well in their mouth, because this song will be witness against the children of Israel. Go on. And all the next chapter that we are going not to study it here, we don't have the time really, all the next song, chapter 32. The hardest words that we have in the Bible against Israel. You see, give ear, O heavens, and I will speak, and hear, O earth, the word of my mouth. I am sharing chapter 32 only to Hebrew talkers. You understand? Only to Hebrew. The Hebrew is so strong there. But what is the purpose of this? And we have to stop here. This chapter 32, which is called Song of Moses, millions of Jews knew it by heart because it was command of God. They knew it by heart. They could cite it by heart. And it describes the terrible thing that happened in our nation, including Holocaust. Including Holocaust. So strong. And that's why when the rabbis were asked why, why it happened, do you remember the answer before? They said because God is hiding his face from us. Because Yeshua is not among us. Allegorically, because you killed Joseph. You remember the words of Reuven from the brothers? Whenever, whenever they came to Joseph, and Joseph didn't know who he is, he said, You're spies, you came to serve the land, that's why you come, you're spies. Immediately, Reuven said to them, now we pay to what we did to a brother. When he was pleading, when he was in the dam, in the, in the cistern, pleading us that we will get him out. And at the same time, well, what we were, we were doing, eating and drinking. You understand? They cannot get out of their mind the cry of their brother, Joseph. We cannot get out of mind what we did to Yeshua, our brother. It's there. So whatever we will have to pass later on, it's because our brother is not with us. We will make a five minute break. And then we will try to see what is the happy end? Because now it's not happy end at all. At all. But God is not leaving us with said end. Praise the Lord. We are before very, very, very great happy end. This will be on the next part of our meeting. I give you five minutes to go to drink something. Okay, we'll have a five minute break. To refresh Please be back. five minutes and we continue Please be on. back in five minutes. Thank you.